been 20 years since Minnesota passed its charter school legislation. Here to discuss the legislative activity surrounding charter schools, we have the chair of the House K-12 Finance Committee, Representative Pat Garofalo. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Julie. Let's begin, Representative Garofalo, with how would you grade today's charter school system? In the state of Minnesota, I would give it about an A- minus or a B plus. We do, as everyone knows, Minnesota is the first state in the nation to have charter schools. And we've done a good job of expanding and promoting those throughout the state of Minnesota. However, the world changes and there needs to be modernization, new accountability metrics put in place. And we've adapted that system through the last 20 years. However, there is more that remains to be done. And you kind of alluded to that. Uh, the legislature has had to step in over the years and pass legislation as different problems would arise particularly recently in the areas of financial accountability and transparency. So do you think more oversight is needed? Well, I think the important thing to remember with charter schools is unlike traditional public schools, when they fail, they fail. They close if uh, parents are not happy with the results, if there's financial impropriety, they close up shop and then new charter schools, the students need to go to new charter schools or new facilities. Whereas in traditional public schools, when they have a financial failure, usually they move into statutory operating debt or there's some level of uh, mechanism of assistance from the state. So I think we're always looking for the best value for the taxpayer. We always want to make sure that there's accountability with those dollars. But right now, I think the, the, the changes we've put in place in the last two years, they seem to be working. Let's give them some time to settle in and make sure they're working. But of course, always have an open mind about anything that can increase financial accountability in any public sector And spending. let's talk a little bit about those changes that the legislature has put in place and maybe some that you think could still be incorporated such as um, the, one of the concerns to this day from the it was a study from the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools it was released prior to the 2012 session and that study places Minnesota now as number two in the nation for charter schools instead of first and one of their key concerns was that Minnesota perhaps didn't provide equitable access to capital funding and facilities so kind of going back to the the funding mechanisms. Do you see this conversation reviving in 2013? Uh, I don't know if it's reviving, but I think it's evolving. Uh, one of the other criticisms that people have about Minnesota is we're very limited in where we allow sponsorships. We put severe restrictions on out-of-state um, sponsorship organizations, and that kind of limits the quality of authorizers who would have access to to uh, providing high-quality education to students in Minnesota. But getting back to your uh, to your original question, I think we want to make sure that we have the financial controls in place to provide good accountability. The reason why those changes were made is there was some concern that, that charter schools were using lease levy dollars to build their own facilities and uh, have outside organizations financially benefit from those. And those are reasonable concerns. We want to make sure that no one's getting rich off the education system. The purpose is not to, to make a profit or to private, uh, to provide private business with an increased profit margin. The purpose is to provide a, a appropriate education for students across the state of Minnesota. So we want to make sure that we have that, we have a level playing field with regards to balancing those concerns. And high student achievement, it's obviously the true purpose of charters and, and traditional schools as well. So do you think that charters in particular are reaching this goal? Well, some are, some aren't. Uh, there's some very um, amazing success stories, particularly uh, Higher Ground, the Hiawatha Leadership Academy, Concordia Creative Learning Academy in Minneapolis and St. Paul, where we see that these, these student populations are overwhelmingly low income, overwhelmingly minority, yet some of their achievement scores are higher than wealthy suburbs. So clearly some of these schools it's working at, other charter schools, they need a little bit of improvement. They need to get better results. But one of the purposes of the original charter school legis legislation back in you know, decades ago was to make sure that we had these sort of laboratories taking place. We find out what works and what doesn't work. And it's clear from these decades of research that one of the things that's, that is helpful is giving site managers control over their personnel, allowing them to decide who they want to keep, who they do not want to keep in the classroom, keeps the best and the brightest teachers in the classroom. This is in contrast to traditional public schools where right now in law we mandate that, uh, that schools are only allowed to use seniority for the retention policies. Um, so charter schools are able to use quality, effectiveness, peer evaluations, but in state law for traditional public schools uh, seniority is the only thing you can use and that, that keeps the best and the brightest teachers out of the classroom and I think next session I think you're going to see a, a more of a movement to having uh, public schools have that sort of flexibility like charter schools have. And you did talk a little earlier about seeing how charter schools are evolving as chair of the K-12 Finance Committee in the House. What's your vision for how charter schools evolve? 
Well, first of all, is we want to make sure that charter schools are treated fairly in terms of financing. One of the big changes we made last session is there's something called the Permanent School Fund. It's a multi-hundred million dollar fund the state of Minnesota administers, and we distribute those funds to the public schools of Minnesota. Well, for decades, charter schools did not receive any of that funding. We thought that was wrong, and Governor Dayton and the legislature corrected that problem, so now charter schools are having access to those funds. Uh, additionally, we have sunsetted a program called integration funding, which traditional public schools have had access to, but charter schools have not been allowed to tap into, even though they have some of the same at-risk populations that traditional schools do. We think it's important that charter schools have access to those funds. But going forward, what we want to do is we want to listen and learn to the charter, learn from the charter school community. Let's find out what's working. Let's find out what's not working, and continue to evolve and adapt. One of the great things we're seeing right now is this explosion of technology in the classroom, and we're able to see that technology truly can provide better educational results at a lower price. I'm very excited. I think in the next two to four years, you're going to see some technology-centric charter schools getting created and built in Minnesota, and more of a focus on that where just like in the private sector, they're able to deliver a lower cost, higher quality product, and that product is quality education for kids. So I'm very excited for the future, particularly with technology and charter schools. Okay, with those words, Representative Garofalo, thank you for joining us today, we appreciate it. I appreciate it, thank you.